Hello, and welcome to our continuing series, our continuing conversation on uh, spirituality. And uh, today is a day that uh, I've been excited about talking about today um, because uh, it's an important um, component of our spiritual journey that I'll be talking about. But perhaps I'll be talking about in a way that um, might be entertaining and might even be um, not only thought-provoking, hopefully, but also uh, will help some of our listeners make connections, not only in their own spiritual journey, uh, but perhaps to put into a, a, a perspective, if you will, uh, the spiritual journeys of great saints uh, that they might have read about um, or heard about over the years. Uh, I'm going to talk about what happens as a person moves into um, trying to become more aware, um, more focused on the big picture. And I, by big picture, of course, as I illustrated yesterday, I'm not just talking about the immensity of stuff around us, like the universe uh, that is there, uh, but I'm also talking about the smallness around us that also seems to have the magnanimity of the universe. Uh, so much that we don't know, so much that uh, we cannot see, um, so much of reality that we're uh, completely dependent on, um, but we do not control and we participate in. Um, but it is not at our beck and call. Uh, so it's very humbling to uh, widen your perspective it's very humbling to break out of the safe part of yourself, uh, to let go of the opinions and the judgments that you might have formed over the years, uh, even those that might have given you comfort, great comfort, and to walk into something that is unknown, uh, something that perhaps we can call uh, the mystery of the presence of God. But as, as you do that, as you enter into it, it's always good to recall that there's been other times in your life, uh, most of the times in relationships that you've already enjoyed or you've already engaged in, where you too have entered into the unknown, where you too have um, participated in um, the adventure of learning, of experiencing life in a completely different way. Every time you're in a relationship with someone, no matter who that person is, there is a certain quality of the unknown that's always present. There's a certain quality of mystery. Something can always be revealed. Something can always be uh, experienced for the first time. Uh, the only time a relationship becomes stale, the only time a relationship becomes no longer life-giving, no longer adventuresome, is basically when you or the other person decide that it's not going to be. When you close your mind, you close your experience, you close your behavior, you close your emotions, and you just say, that's it. There's nothing more that I can learn. There's nothing more that I can experience. This is now something or someone that I just have to endure. Uh, but that always comes later on in a relationship, if it does at all. Thankfully, it doesn't happen in every relationship. But relationships that get worn out, relationships that get toxic, relationships that get tired, it, it can happen. But at the beginning of the relationship, there's always a great excitement. There's, there's a desire to know more, to participate more, to experience more. And that's what I'm talking about in spirituality when I'm talking about the, uh, entering further into the mystery of God's presence, entering further into the adventure of uh, knowing who you are as a human person in relationship uh, with the Creator God. There is a real energy there. There's a real blessing there. Uh, there's a real grace. There's also a danger. Um, and the danger is uh, a danger that I will, for lack of a better word, describe as uh, spiritual intoxication. You become intoxicated by it. Uh, just as you become intoxicated if you drink uh, too much liquor or if you have too many beers or 
the fourth glass of wine that you probably should have stopped after the second glass of wine. Uh, intoxication. And intoxication changes your perspective. Uh, it numbs your reaction. Um, it puts you in a place where you know that when the intoxication wears off, that you're going to have a big price to pay. Uh, but nonetheless, you, you, you find yourself uh, in this experience of intoxication. You also find yourself, when you're intoxicated, doing stupid things or saying stupid things because your inhibitions are not as strong as they might be and your ability to uh, self-edit is not as active as it should be. So that's why sometimes when people are in an intoxicated state, they find themselves doing uh, really, really stupid things. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the risk that I'm talking about, spiritual intoxication, comes when one begins to absorb or um, enter into or experience or claim um, all the experiences and perceptions and everything that's around them, and it's too much. You can't have that much. Uh, it overwhelms you. Um, it isn't in proportion. You don't really have the time to, to truly enjoy it. Uh, you're not being focused on it. Uh, you're not being mindful of what's happening to you. There's just a huge amount that's coming in. And so as a result, you kind of lose control. You kind of uh, lose your ability to learn from the experience. Um, and you're capable of um, getting trapped in that. Uh, you're capable of being changed forever by that experience, uh, but not necessarily in a good way. You're also, and this is something that um, people don't like to admit, but when you're intoxicated, you're easily manipulated. So in the midst of your intoxication, if someone suggests something to you, that if you weren't intoxicated, there's no way that you would think it's a good idea. Uh, when you're intoxicated, you can be manipulated to do it. Uh, so for instance, someone will suggest that you do something, you know, let's go outside and go over to the neighbor's house and throw all the expensive toilet paper that we have over their ceilings and over their roofs and over their trees. Won't that be a great idea? Um, no, that's not a great idea. It never was a great idea. But in the minute and in the moment of uh, being intoxicated, it might sound like it's the thing that needs to be done. So spiritual intoxication also is that way. You can be manipulated into doing things or reacting to things in a way that perhaps you should not. Um, and that under normal circumstances, you would not do. There are examples that I could give you of spiritual intoxication to the extreme. Um, but I, I prefer not to do that at the moment. Uh, perhaps later on in our conversation, I might suggest one or two. But I think if you can think of things that have been done by individual people, supposedly in the name of God or in the name of religion, uh, drastic things, uh, dramatic things that have been done, um, you can see that there is the uh, spiritual intoxication at work, and you can also, I think, see the finger of manipulation at work. <clears throat> it's always um, interesting to me that people who are manipulated into doing something that is uh, not good and very dramatic many times have someone in the background who's pulling the strings and manipulating the result, but who they themselves are unwilling to do it. And so it's not very convincing to me. I see it as a form of intoxication and manipulation. But enough about that. Let's talk about normal uh, spiritual intoxication and normal uh, ways that we react to it. Intoxication is not real. Uh, it is a false state. It's a disconnected part of who you are. Uh, it's a real experience in so far that you actually are feeling what you feel but it is something that is uh, substantially um, influenced by the fact that you've taken in too much of something and that you have not uh, spent enough time processing it or you've overwhelmed the system. 
uh, in a way that you cannot process it. Um, I think sometimes uh, when you hear people talking about uh, spirituality and they talk about the fact that early in their spiritual um, life, early in their spiritual journey, and this is a word that they'll use, it's a traditional word, they felt so much consolation. Oh, God was so present. Every time I went to pray, I could feel the presence of God. I, everything was so easy. It was so easy to say yes to God. It was so easy to imagine what I should be doing next. And it, They'll talk about all of this experience, this behavior, this sense of wonderment. And then all of a sudden, they'll start talking about desolation. Um, there, it's not there. I don't know what it is. You know, I go pray, and, you know, six months ago, I go pray, I could pray for two hours. Now when I go pray, it just, time drags on forever. What's happening to me? Well, what's happening to you is you're moving from what I call the spiritual intoxication, and you're crashing. You're crashing down to um, a real experience, uh, not one that is dramatically exaggerated. You're crashing down to the real experience of uh, who we are as a human being, who you are in relationship with others. And you're, you're called in what you might think is desolation. You're called nonetheless to see in a different way. Uh, but the way you're going to see is not going to have all of the bells and whistles and the drama that once was there. It's going to be a totally uh, different experience and it's going to demand a totally different response. Let me talk about two characters that we know of from history uh, that would illustrate this point. And then what I want to do is talk about the remedy. Uh, the remedy to spiritual intoxication uh, and the remedy to this feeling of being crashed or losing everything um, and how it is, in fact, a spiritual connecting point. Let me talk about one uh, person, and you might not consider this person to be an example for spiritual intoxication, but from my perspective, I think it's a perfect example. It turns out he's a saint, not just a little saint. He's a very big saint, very big in every way you can possibly imagine. And the name of that saint is St. Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas, from what we can um, understand and what we've been told from history, was a man who lived large. He lived dramatically. Uh, he had ferocious intellectual appetite and capacity. Um, he also had ferocious appetites. Uh, as it turned out, as he lived in life, he dramatically entered into life and enjoyed it to the fullest. He became, as time went on, quite large um, as he enjoyed the experience of life and as he feasted uh, not only on ideas, but he also feasted on everything else that was in front of him, um, which is not a, a bad thing. I'm just saying that that's how it developed. He was a huge person, a huge man. And he was what we would today call a systematic theologian. Now, I understand that I'm not going to explain systematic theology to you in the fullness of how wonderful it is, how important it is in the history of the church, or how essential it is in our understanding of uh, spirituality. That's not my goal this morning. My goal is to point out the systematic theology is based on a very simple principle. And that is that you ask questions and you keep answering them. And every time that you answer a question, sometimes other questions are revealed. And so you include those questions in your answer and you keep answering and answering and answering. And eventually the system of responding to the questions will lead you to a point where the subject that you're discussing or considering is completely and totally uh, exhausted. You have the answer. You know exactly what it is. There's no other questions that are uh, possible, and you can give the definitive, the absolute answer. 
So the promise of systematic theology is, is if you faithfully follow the system of question and answer, question and answer, question and answer, eventually you'll get to the point where all your questions will be answered and everything will be solved. That's, that's the, the promise, if you will, of systematic theology in a nutshell. It's much more complicated than that, but for our purpose, that's what it is. St. Thomas Aquinas was a systematic theologian. Uh, in fact, behind me in the bookcase, near the top shelf, there are books and books and books written by St. Thomas Aquinas. His Summa Theologica, his summary of theology, in which he dared to ask the questions and provide the answers and ask even more questions and provide more answers. And it went from volume to volume to volume to volume to volume as he consumed this whole dynamic of question and answer, question and answer, question and answer, all about spirituality, God, the church, the meaning of life, um, his ferocious appetite for being able to ask the questions and to consume the answers, drove them on, drove them on, drove them on. Uh, and for that, we're grateful for the gift that he has given us over the years. But near the end of his life, he came to the point where he is quoted as saying that everything, everything is straw. Doesn't mean anything. Everything is straw. Uh, now, if you want to spiritualize that, what you would say is, is he became aware um, of the power of God and the mystery of God and just basked in the knowledge of God and that that was enough for him. Uh, and that is true. But I think what also is true is he realized that the system wasn't going to answer the questions. There never was going to be a point in time where all the answers were there. There is no such thing as no more questions. There is no such thing as everything is at the end. There is no such thing as the total, 100%, complete, absolute, nothing else possible. That's not how it is. That's not what mystery means. That's not the power of God's grace, and the power of God's life and love. It never runs out. It's never going to have everything answered. It never becomes static. It never ends. It's constantly ongoing, constantly regenerating, constantly recreating, and it never stops. And so what you come up with, what you come up with is an understanding that your pursuit of trying to answer all the questions to reach a certain point of certitude, in a sense, is a fool's errand. There is no certitude. Uh, there is only mystery. And St. Thomas Aquinas uh, teaches us that and leaves us uh, that witness in his own life. And despite all the answers that he gave us, all the questions that he unraveled for us, the risk that he took theologically and spiritually to enter into the fullness of trying to understand the mystery of God is a great gift to us, but it's not complete and it will never be complete. So he understood that and near the end of his life embraced it and embraced the mystery and uh, embraced the fullness of God's life and love in that way. The other person is a contemporary of sorts of Thomas Aquinas, but he um, illustrates something else in the process. And in Catholic uh, circles, he's not usually talked about very much, uh, certainly not talked about within the context of um, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, I would doubt that we mentioned both of their names on the same day ever. Uh, but the other person that I'm thinking of is Martin Luther. And Martin Luther was a uh, dramatic person also. He was a person who uh, was blessed with a great intellect. He was an Augustinian monk. Uh, he was dedicated to the church, uh, dedicated to a spiritual life, uh, dedicated to spiritual journeying, and uh, did not hesitate to use all of his energy uh, to pursue uh, 
learning more and more about God and his relationship with his people. But the other thing that um, Martin Luther had was despite his great intellect, despite his great knowledge, uh, despite all the things that he had, he had within himself a, uh, an open sore, if you will. Um, he doubted. He doubted that he was truly loved by God. Um, he could not fill up the emptiness that he had within himself, this feeling of being not completely loved. And no matter what he did, no matter how many prayers he said, no how many or how many fasting days he accumulated, no matter what he did, he could not fill up within himself the sense of emptiness. And so as he continues his spiritual journey and as he continues to accumulate all the things that he thought was going to help him with his sense of being filled and the sense of com being complete, he realized exactly the opposite. And he became even more um, focused on the idea of merit, that you could somehow be merited the gift of God's life and the gift of God's grace, so that there could be something that you could do that would, in a sense, force God to love you, uh, that you could pile up enough merits, you could pile up enough grace, and God would have to take you. You know, that would, that's an exaggeration, but that's kind of like what Martin felt. Eventually, Martin gets to a point in his life when the, the, the emptiness, the, the uh, desire to be united to God uh, becomes so overwhelming, so focused, so important, and all the other stuff that he was doing became, like Thomas Aquinas, like so much straw, that he enters into the critical moment of his own spiritual journey and he realizes that there's a great moment of grace that's present there. But it scares literally the hell out of him. Because he realizes that Abel, his ability to enter into the moment, to enter into what he's being called to do, to seek and to claim the freedom that he wanted so badly and that he felt that was necessary for his own experience of life, there was a huge price to pay for it. And the price to pay for it was he had to die. He had to die to all of his ideas. He had to die to self. He had to die to merit. He had to die to certitude. He had to die to everything. And as he stood there in death, completely stripped of everything that he thought he could accomplish and that he thought that he needed, he was completely and totally vulnerable. And the vulnerability overwhelmed him. And as he stood there in his vulnerability, not knowing what to do, he then realized that everything was gift. Everything was grace. Nothing could be merited. Nothing could be earned. And in fact, there was no need to merit or earn anything. It had already been given to you by God our Father in the person of his son Jesus. For Martin to come to that point of understanding and acceptance meant that he had to face his own death. He had to let go of everything that he thought he knew. It contradicted everything that he taught. It contradicted everything that he believed up to that point. But it brought him to the freedom of life. It brought him to the freedom of grace. It brought him to the conviction of God's saving love. And ultimately, of course, what it did was it brought him to a sense of freedom that he did not think he could ever experience, but he was able to experience it in his vulnerability. Both Thomas Aquinas and Martin Luther both encounter the vulnerability. 
as we've already learned and as we already know, in relationship, vulnerability is extremely necessary. It comes as we exchange with one another truth, as we learn about each other, as we experience what it means to be individual people, what it means to love, what it means to forgive, what it needs to question, all those things. And then you get to the point uh, where you realize that you have to let it all go. And the only thing that's left is that vulnerability, that emptiness, if you will. Um, but on the other side of the vulnerability, on the other side of the em emptiness is the promise of intimacy, is the promise that Jesus speaks about when he speaks about his relationship with his heavenly father. There are no shortcuts. There's no way to avoid it. Well, I shouldn't say there is no way to avoid it. There is a way to avoid it. The way to avoid it is to insist on remaining intoxicated, to insist on accumulating spiritual gifts, to insist on performing spiritual exercises that bring you to a point of merit so that at the end of the day, you can sit in your room and you can count up all your spiritual graces and all your spiritual blessings, and you can say to yourself, now, I'm perfect. God has to love me. But even in the midst of all that, you're going to hear a very small voice that's going to be saying, no, that's not it at all. That's not it. That's not the way. That's not the life. That's not the truth. It doesn't lead anywhere. It, in fact, is a distraction. As I promised at the beginning of this um, discussion about spiritual life and spiritual connecting points and spiritual journey, um, I promised you that there is a remedy. There is a remedy to spiritual intoxication. Uh, there is a remedy that is offered to us uh, that comes as the ultimate grace from God, that uh, comes to us as a gift, and that changes us. And that remedy is very often misunderstood and not appreciated, but it is essential. The remedy is silence. Silence. Learning how not to do anything. Learning that it's enough to simply be present. Letting go of every thought and desire that you think you need in order to be filled. And simply to let the work of the Spirit change you, convert you, prepare you for what is to come next. Silence is so important, and the saints all tell us that. Silence is the essential nutrient of the soul. If you don't experience silence, if you don't experience just being present, your soul is starving. It's calling out for that nutrient. It wants to be fed. And so very, very often, especially if you have the unfortunate um, experience of having a spiritual director who doesn't understand spiritual direction and doesn't understand the work of the Spirit, they're going to let you rattle on and on and on and on about your desolation and they're going to let you um, find remedies to return to the distraction. The silence is the remedy. The silence is the gift. The silence is that which prepares you for the next step. The silence enables you to revel in the truth. It enables you to experience the vulnerability as something that is gift, not punishment, gift. 
And then the silence prepares you to hear the voice of God, the voice of God that is always there, but the voice of God that cannot be heard if your life is filled with distractions and all other things. You need to be silent, to just be present. And in the silence, what will take place is an ultimate connection with God. That's why if you pay attention to the scriptures, Jesus was constantly telling his apostles and disciples, let's get away. Let's get away. Let's withdraw. Let's go to this silent place. You don't need to be told how great you are. You don't need to have the crowds asking you for something. You don't need to do anything. You simply need to be present to your Heavenly Father. So tomorrow we're going to talk about what silence prepares us for. What is the experience that silence enables within us? And how does silence cooperate with this new connecting point, this new experience, and enable us to become more and more disciples of Jesus and people who live with confidence in the kingdom of God? Have a great day. Enjoy yourself, and we'll meet again tomorrow.